Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Dean's Lecture Series today uh, with our guest speaker, Miriam Kamara. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to give a land acknowledgement. Uh, though we are dispersed virtually today, we gather in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous, of indigenous knowledge in the professions of the built environment generally and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curriculum. I'd also like to further acknowledge that uh, we're pleased that this lecture has been uh, made possible by the John F. Forster uh, 64, uh, 1964 Fund. The fund was created in memory of John Forster, who received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Columbia in 1964. Mr. Forster went on to become a practicing architect working on a variety of architectural and interior design projects throughout New York City and in the greater New York metropolitan area. He was an active member of the AIA New York chapter. This fund honors his experience at GSAP during which he benefited enormously from the opportunity to engage and interact with some of the greatest architects of his time. The fund hopes to inspire and continue these important interactions between generations of architects. Through the generation of the Forster family, we are pleased to have Miriam Kamara offer an insight, an insightful lecture this afternoon, and also to participate in the Core 3 housing studio tomorrow morning. So now for our guest speaker. Miriam Kamara is an architect from Niger who studied architecture at the University of Washington. In 2013, she co-founded the architectural collective United for Design, alongside Yassi Ismali and Elizabeth Golden and Peter Strader. The collective worked on projects in the United States, Afghanistan, and Niger. Miami 2000, uh, designed by United for Design, was awarded an American Institute of Architects Seattle Award and the Architects Magazine 2017 R&D Award for Innovation. Hikma uh, Religious and Secular Complex, designed by Kamara and Yassi Ismali, won the 2017 Gold Lafarge Holcomb Award for Africa and the Middle East and the 2018 Silver Global Lafarge Holcomb Award for Sustainable Architecture. In 2014, Kamara founded Atelier Masomi, an architecture and research practice with offices in Niger's capital of Niamey. The firm tackles public, cultural, residential, commercial, and urban design projects. Kamara believes that architects have an important role to play in creating spaces that have the power to elevate, dignify, and provide people with a better quality of life. Other projects include the Dandaji uh, Regional Market, with, which was shortlisted for the Design Awards in 2019. Upcoming projects include an office building in Niami, as well as the Niami Cultural Center, which Kamara designed under the mentorship of Sir David Ajay as part of the Rolex Mentor and Protege Initiative. Also in 2019, Kamara was uh, a laureate of the Prince Klaus Award. Uh, she was a 2019 Royal Academy of Arts Dorfman Awards finalist as well. Last year, the New York Times named her as one of the 15 creative women of our time. She was the head of the jury for the Middle East Africa, uh, for the Middle East Africa at the LaForge Holcomb Awards and uh, the Royal Institute of Canada named her as one of their 2020 honorary fellows. Please join me this afternoon in welcoming to GSAP, Mariam Kamara. Thank you so much, Mariam. This was such an amazing introduction. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to this lecture for quite some time, actually. So it's been, it feels a long way coming. Um, last time I gave a lecture at Columbia, it was 
a bit shorter. So I've been looking for the opportunity to have a longer discussion. Thank you. I was really interested in talking about, you know, our work when it comes to memory and how um, both as a firm and for me as a practitioner, I really use um, architecture as a way of um, digging into memories, collective memories, individual ones, and usually really using memory as a blueprint um, for architecture, which I'm not sure if that's a very popular notion considering the fact that we've been um, largely taught to view architecture as some kind of tabula rasa, um, uh, you know, tabula rasa exercise, you know, especially through modernism where it, it was kind of assumed that we we're supposed to kind of invent everything even though really we, we never do, um, but that seems to be always the effort. Um, but I just really wanted to talk about this, this issue of, um, of memory, particularly because it seems that while progress is really important, and I would say even vital, obviously, um, I've always wondered if it means um, that we've kind of relegated, you know, over the 20th century memory to, you know, really museums as something that people can really encounter, you know, in these museums that are receptacles now of um, the whole world's memory. Um, and I'm not gonna get into um, all of the issues surrounding museums and <laughs> all of the collective memories of the world that are in there. But it's just been, it's just been kind of um, nagging at me that the, um, the true power of memory, you know, um, as we've encountered it through our practice is really what it teaches us, the power that it has to teach us fundamental truth about ourselves, about our environment, but also how it provides us with crucial keys and clues for how to evolve and how to go forward and, and build a forward momentum, really. Um, this has been an essential, has been essentially the approach of the practice um, that we've developed in Niger um, as a firm over the years, whether, whether when, we talk, when we work on projects in, in West Africa or elsewhere now. Um, this image, for example, is of the market of Dandaji in Niger, um, as it was roughly um, five years ago, a project that we worked on. Um, it was a weekly market that only operated on Fridays. And the idea was to create a new market that would eventually operate daily um, after a transition period um, in order to help the local market um, and market economy flourish in some sense. And one thing that caught our, our eye immediately was how it was organized around this tree that was a local fixture in the village. And many said that that tree had probably been there for over a century. And it was just really this marker um, for all of the inhabitants of Dandaji. Um, and as we were walking through, um, we just you know, took note of these styles that were very simple and straightforward with an architecture made of mud. Um, the walls were very, you know, just linear with a flat thatch roof. Um, and those, and that, you know, those thin thatch roofs, you know, had the advantage of offering really good ventilation. Um, but the roofs themselves were a challenge um, because they needed to be changed all the time. That thatch doesn't really hold up to rainy seasons, you know, and strong winds. Um, but nevertheless, the market had this model for quite a few decades, you know, at that point. And it was very much in keeping with um, traditional market architecture going back centuries you know, in the region. So there was something very compelling about it. And so when it came to designing the project, it was evident to me um, that there was very little value really in overhauling the way things were already done. Um, rather, I was much more interested in how to incent it and make it more functional based on what we had observed um, in the daily tasks of, of, the, of the market goers and the logistics behind actually what they needed um, to do and accomplish and how they brought their, way, their wares, how they displayed everything, how they packed everything up, how they secured um, their goods. And so we, we devised um, these, you know, we, we used um, the same language, you know, with these kind of simple pared down walls, but then also devised, you know, these more sh durable shading systems um, that also foster ventilation, you know, again, you know, um, taking our cue from the patch roofs. Um, but it also but help cool down the temperature at ground level by using um, heating up you know the metal naturally to kind of help suck up um, hot air that would be right below. So in the end, the result was that we kept we kept the memory of that original market you know using a similar architectural language with the earthquakes 
Um, and it was important for us that the people felt comfortable in the new market while still making it, you know, a modern proposition, you know, keeping traditional materials where it made sense and introducing new approaches where needed. So one, one, one thing um, that we noticed on market opening day, which this, this image shows, uh, was that the sellers found their marks immediately, which was very, you know, rewarding. Um, but it was also really interesting to see how they started using this new infrastructure in even newer ways, because they saw opportunities, you know, either because of shading structures or because of the way we partitioned the spaces and created, you know, places for them to park the motorcycles or, you know, um, store um, their goods. They started using it in new and inventive ways, actually, because we have provided additional spaces now for them to explore and um, do more with. But ultimately, the crucial aspect of the project was the fact that we provided an open air space market instead of an enclosed shed, you know, with stalls, you know, inside of it, which is a lot of times what we, we tend to go towards when we're trying to do more contemporary markets in Africa. Um, and this means that because it was open space, it could be, it could operate as a public space and even became a playground actually for the school next door. Um, and these open spaces, just like the stalls themselves, were something the population immediately co-opted. Um, and they, there was kind of this fundamental understanding um, of how to use it and also how to transform, transform it and co-opt it. So the results, you know, at the end of the day was just this market that kept what is familiar, but pushed the expression forward. You know, and we've kind of explored this, you know, over and over again throughout, you know, all the typologies of the projects that we've worked on. You know, during our explorations of the local context in Niger, one thing that one cannot miss, you know, if anybody, you know, has ever been here or, or a country like, like this one, um, is the amount of blank walls that one encounters, which is a direct response to the climate. So this picture was taken in the old town of Zender um, in Niger, which has traditional architecture and this traditional quarter um, that is intact and has been there for a few centuries. And we've learned a great deal from these strategies aimed at creating shade, but also avoiding openings you know, on the street side in order to avoid attracting heat and direct sunlight. And so these are principles that um, we've used um, for, for many projects, including, you know, more commercial projects, you know, in this case for this office building project we have currently under construction in Niger, where we were interested in embodying the climatic principles that we learned were vertically by, you know, first breaking up the volume, um, trying to provide ways in which, you know, we can create zones of um, ventilation, um, how we can actually allow cross ventilation also by breaking it up a bit more how we can be a bit more, you know, um, aware of obviously, you know, how the sun moves around the building, how we can start, you know, seeing what that means for a building such as this one and start to carve it to sh shield um, where we need shielding and to provide openings among, along the sides um, and the facade um, where we have openings and actually only placing openings where we know we already have shade present to help mitigate um, insulation and decrease um, energy consumption. And obviously it was also about acknowledging, this is kind of one of the images of a few months ago of the project under construction, acknowledging that part of the memory you know, of the place is also in its material. You know, in this case, we're using earth, which, which will make this project one of the only multi-story projects um, in the region made out of raw earth, um, up at a, a um, hybrid system, you know, using concrete structure and, and the, um, the earth bricks as filling, um, it was uniquely appropriate in the sense that, you know, it has an economic advantage, you know, so for, for clients, this is very interesting because it brings down um, the construction cost by close to 20% um, rather than using cement, but it also introduces significant re reduction in energy consumption, which is a big deal when you're thinking about an office um, building that consumes a lot of energy, that produces a lot of heat, while it's trying to also shield itself from the ambient heat. So the project will complete construction mid next year, but it has, it has been an incredible testing ground that had allowed us to um, start exploring how the architecture memories of a place can take fundamentally different forms um, to adapt to the new typologies of today, so to say.
So similarly, um, when we had the opportunity to develop a design for a mosque and library um, that constituted a community center in, in Dandaji, the same place we make the market, we didn't necessarily go and look to mosque typologies in the Middle East for precedence. In Islam, um, there is no prescribed typology um, for its places of worship, which we considered as a fantastic opportunity. So the first step was to look to pre-colonial cities like Kano, which is um, shown here, or Zaria in Nigeria, uh, which shared the same cultural makeup as the village of Dandaji where we were working and where the project was sited. Um, these zones, these, these cities and this village were actually part of the same Hausa kingdom um, before the, Europe, the, the European arbitrarily, I mean, um, before Europe arbitrarily kind of partitions, partitioned Africa. And so um, a typology through our research that immediately jumped out was definitely not what we normally see in the Middle East. Um, there was often several volumes, you know, in the mosque that we, we noticed um, in these other pre-colonial Hausa towns. Um, there were these, you know, the, the, these entrance gates that kept repeating themselves and that served as um, transition zones and as ablution, you know, stations for cleansing, for cleansing rituals. Um, before prayer, and this is something that we immediately, you know, jumped at, right, and, and we reintroduced in the project as, in a way, kind of the perfect transition zone before proceeding to the mosque proper. Oops. But going back further, um, as we were investigating, you know, the history of the mosque prototype and the mosque program, more specifically, um, we learned also of some of the earlier ways in which mosques were, were done, you know, as far back as the ninth century, where actually knowledge, mosques were actually knowledge centers um, in places like Baghdad, where they often went hand in hand with libraries, with schools and research centers, teaming with scholars from all over the world, actually, who came and taught and learned and researched. Um, and because the project involves taking an existing traditional building, which you can see on the left hand side here, um, renovating it and adapting it into for a new use. Um, we use that model called Bayat al Hikmah or House of Wisdom to turn the project into a community center that has both that had both a mosque but also a library, classrooms, and workshop spaces um, for the community. And so you know, I think through this project, tapping into the memory of the Islamic culture itself, rather than just kind of taking the form of what we see as Islamic architecture, quote unquote, today, allowed us to bring back a typology that is directly relevant to, you know, to our times in the context of growing tensions that we experience, certainly in Niger, between secular knowledge and religious practice. Um, when one considers that, geographically speaking, um, if one looks at, at a map, we're surrounded by, you know, Libya and Algeria to the north, Chad to the east, northern Nigeria that has issues with Boko Haram to the south, and Mali that has issues with, with Al Qaeda in the in Al Qaeda offshoots um, to the west. But ultimately, um, while developing this project, as we we're grappling with all of these, you know, religious and social and you know, political. Um, aspects, we were also developing a project that was about understanding the memory of a place as it's being embedded in the people who kind of carry the, um, the knowledge within them and that pass it down. And harnessing that knowledge has been one of the most important aspects of the project, um, but also of our practice, honestly. Uh, we approached traditional masons um, to have them bring the adobe building that I was pointing to earlier back to life but also to learn from, from them things that we can learn in our Western focused schools, um, which certainly was a big challenge for me. Having been um, schooled in the US, it was very difficult for me to figure out how to develop a language for an architecture that is rooted in a completely different context. And, uh, and you should know that actually Masons in most of West Africa were traditionally organized in really powerful guilds and they were handed their knowledge um, from generation to gen generation and their expertise is often a closely guarded secret. So for us, it was quite a treat to actually get to, to work with them and have them share their knowledge with us. And actually, um, I guess up until recently, people thought that Masons had magic powers, I mean, mystical powers because of the creativity and the aesthetic sense and technical skill that they, um, that they portrayed. 
in these tradi tra traditional domes, sorry, um, that are showing the interior of the old Demdaj mosque that we turned into the library, um, are one of the reasons why not only did we want to save this building that was dated for dem demolition, but we it was really important for us to find um, the original masons who built this project and defer to them in you know in defer to their expertise in refurbishing um, the project by collaborating with the kind of more contemporary masons to help in improving um, the materials that were being used, improving the durability, and to make sure that we create kind of a healthy and, and safe space um, for the students who, who were the, largely the target um, for the library in the village. And so when it came to the mosque proper, um, which was the other part of this complex, we collaborated with you know, these other kind of more contemporary traditional masons um, and, and local engineers um, from, from Miami to produce, in a way, a new interpretation of the traditional domes that I showed you, I kind of simplified, more pared down, still using earth, but then, you know, introducing concrete because we were interested in, you know, larger scales, you know, and much more dramatic heights um, for, um, um, for the new mosque. And it allowed us to further anchor the project as part of a cultural and stylistic evolution rather than importing a radically different structural, structural solution or aesthetic um, expression. So, you know, this was kind of the, the result of, of that exercise. Um, this is um, one of the ceilings of one of the volumes of the mosques. And it was really about elevating the local material and the techniques um, using processes that people are already familiar with while introducing sort of new, um, new techniques. Um, to share. Working through that project, actually, another powerful memory, memory we, we harness, um, we harness and continue to do so, and we did for the market project as well, is the skill of metal work. Um, in West Africa, um, blacksmiths are a really skilled and respected um, group since roughly, some say 1500 before Common Era. There have been blacksmiths in the area, and they have they have kind of um, developed um, this craftsmanship, you know, over the centuries. And similar to the mason guilds and builders, they were also considered one of those groups with mystical powers, you know, so great that their ingenuity, you know, because of the ingenuity and their skill, um, and literally it was believed that they could help win wars or take over empires. You know, such was their importance. Um, to um, to local to to the the kings and empires of the, of the time, and because Niger is an arid country with very few trees, uh, wood is not a material we use in architecture um, when we build there. Instead, we've been using vast amounts of recycled iron that metal workers, you know, all over the the, the country, but definitely in the capital of Niamey, melt down from things like motorcycle and car parts and turn them into everyday objects and these square tubes that you see in this image um, that are used in construction for making light structures, for making doors, for making windows, you name it. Um, and it was astonishing actually to see how with just a handful of tools and uh, these modern day blacksmiths, you know, as, as I like to think of them, could make just about anything. And it was just incredible how little was required to do that. And so um, we came quickly to understand that, you know, what, what, we, what we understood was that you know, anything we could draw really and or imagine, they could make, provided that we understood this fundamental principle of using simple materials and simple tools to make it happen. And so in the end, um, the objective was to bring about a richer solution. Um, and kind of widen the toolbox of knowledge for us, you know, by tapping into those memories to produce something um, that is very much rooted in the local context, in the local memory, and that could actually further, you know, that memory, add its own layer to these collective memories that we have of our identity, of who we are as a people, and how we move forward in the in the world. But that being said. Um, Along the way, I think one of the things that I realized was that memory can also be treacherous sometimes and can be fraught with traps, um, particularly because of the way we're often taught to practice and see architecture as a form to be analyzed, 
to be deconstructed um, and reconstructed, or sometimes even simply just pastiched as a series of motifs, you know, kind of completely removed from its initial um, context and, and purpose. And during colonization, um, the French in West Africa, um, in, in the, the French part of West Africa created this style called Neo-Sudanese architecture, which consisted in taking buildings like the Jamia Mosque, which you see on this image here, and making that the basis for all administrative and monumental buildings for all of their territories um, that they had taken over, regardless of you know, the culture of that place, regardless of you know, the traditional architecture that exists there. You know, that was just, that became kind of the architecture uniform you know, for their empire. And so they made things like these, which is a maternity ward in Senegal um, that they had built and that looks you know, just like the Jenny Mosque, right? It was just essentially a copy of that with just kind of, you know, some new kind of um, more modern looking windows, you know, on the facade. Or this train station in Burkina Faso, which actually looks very close to both the Jenny Mosque, but also the Timbuktu Mosque, which I don't have a good image for to show you. Or even the presidential palace, this is the one in Niger, um, where, you know, that, that whenever I look at these buildings, you know, one of the things, you know, for us who know this typology, we quickly start realizing that all of these administrative buildings actually look like mosques, um, complete even with the minaret, you know, so it's just kind of really separating the use um, and the symbolism um, from the original buildings. And the danger here is that the form itself and its actual meaning, you know, it's, is reduced down to a plastic rendition only. You know, and we use the structural logic that, that brought it, you know, into being. We use this, the spatial reasoning, you know, the symbolism, you know, behind the originals, all of which really contribute to having a less meaningful architecture, you know, ultimately. And so for me, these, these forms, you know, why they are blueprints, you know, to be analyzed and for which, you know, I mean, there are blueprints to be analyzed, but more so as, you know, as a way of understanding fundamental and underlying forces and principles that brought them to life. So one challenge has been, you know, um, coming up with new kind of narratives, architectural narratives and continuity for um, architecture in Niger. When we consider that, you know, we either have the traditional buildings that we're lucky enough to still have, or we have these completely Western, you know, um, propositions and kind of nothing in between. And so, you know, to, to figure out how to forge a way forward, um, we've had to also tap a lot into communal or community memory, you know, in terms of um, the, the knowledge that they have, you know, the kind of intrinsic um, wisdom, you know, in the cultural behaviors in that, that really all point to how space is, viewed psychologically, emotionally, and what the needs are, you know, for the spaces that we need to design moving forward. And it's not unlike, you know, some of the exercises that we've done, you know, through, um, I mean, by tapping into the skills and knowledge of the blacksmiths or of the masons, you know, your average daily person also was kind of a wealth of information and kind of um, minefield of, you know, memories to tap into and to harness. In, to, to kind of take it even further, you know, I think I've talked about this a couple of times, there's, there's, we found also that there was just a wealth of memories embedded in obviously the climate and the geography of the place, you know, which is something that we talk about a lot these days, especially because of climate change and how it's been impacting us. Um, and it is embodied in, you know, traditional architectures all over the world that we have seen throughout history. Um, and so for Niger, again, you know, looking at such an extreme climate, you know, such a hot and arid condition, um, we've spent a lot of time looking at similar conditions all over the world for cues, again, for additional wisdoms, additional memories that we can layer, you know, and kind of learn from without necessarily copying, you know, so whether it's in Asia or South America or anywhere else, you know, that where we can find parallels. Um, the idea is that, you know, you can, you can fit a lot of those parallels, you know, when you meet similar conditions, right? Um, and so, for example, in the desert climate, as I was saying, you know, harvesting rainwater is key. So, you know, when you look about, when you look at all the different ways in which 
rainwater has been harvested through architecture, you know, in these incredible, beautiful ways. There's really a lot, you know, to, to take from, you know, just like this image shows. Um, when you look at, when you think about the step wells, you know, in Rajasthan or in Gujarat, um, in India, or the wind, wind catchers in Iran that co buildings interiors um, to lower energy consumption naturally, um, or the first tall structures made out of earth in Yemen, for example, um, for a look at an alternative building technology, you know, and an alternative way or different ways of actually dealing with density um, and dealing with also circulation and how you move through, you know, these vertical um, spaces and what they mean and how they came about. And so sometimes um, we get to work on projects that allow us to explore all of these things combined and more, you know, tapping into those memories embedded in culture, technical skills, and geographic imperatives, you know, and tapping into those memories. Um, this, this was kind of one, one project that, that started from the premise of, you know, the fact that culturally in Asia, we, we largely live outside. You know, even when you would see people in front of their homes, you know, just lounging all the time in front of office buildings, in front of, you know, or on the roof of their homes, you name it. And so we started imagining um, these interconnected public zones that we could um, devise on the site for a future cultural project in Yemen, and how these zones could help to fragment the project and ensure kind of a freer access to its ground looking for you know, different areas um, where that could be natural gathering points. And also obviously being conscious of the temperatures um, that are really harsh for open spaces in Asia, especially when we start designing really, really large ones, obviously. And that naturally sort of led us to creating shade through these dramatic sculptural forms um, that also serve as a landmark and a beacon um, for the project throughout the city. And then organizing indoor program, you know, around all of all of that for people to enjoy and to effortlessly, you know, create an indoor outdoor relationship between program and open space, which is very difficult of Nigerian architecture actually when you go back in history, or how we go about developing, you know, or ever kind of started to use these forms um, to develop um, natural cooling mechanisms um, by, by by using these sculptural towers. And obviously, this being an Arab country and it only rains three months out of the year, it was also really important that we are very deliberate about collecting rainwater and not just letting it go into sewers, you know, or going back into the river, but actually really using it as, you know, just this amazing um, resource that we have to help us then create gardens and irrigate them and create shady trees um, all over the project for people to be able to stroll and enjoy, you know, um, in a comfortable kind of ecosystem. And so the result was really the set of buildings that draw from the site, um, the memories and narratives of the place, but also anticipate on future challenges by finding low cost and simple ways um, to mitigate them. Um, it seemed at, you know, like looking at it, you know, it seems at, at once to be of another time, but it also is firmly anchored in the now and definitely looking, you know, to the tomorrow. And just like for the most projects, you know, the architecture really seeks to use forms and you know, structural solutions that are familiar to traditional builders. One of the things that was incredibly important for us was to make a project of this scale, but with local materials that live you know, in nearby villages um, to help stretch their skills you know, to kind of the, the, the extreme um, by having to deal with these kinds of, with these kinds of scales but also help the technologies you know, of these materials you know, evolve um, and kind of aiding in any way that we can for that purpose. And so um, the buildings beca became a system, you know, um, and a system that kind of does multiple things at once, you know, a system of um, buildings that are traditional in their technique and, and in their materials, but also contemporary in their scale, in their programming, um, and in the seriousness of the approach to sustainability, you know, but it's approach to sustainability that we've learned from the past as much as possible um, in order to not have to rely always on, you know, mechanical um, solutions or, you know, technological solutions, which have their place here, but they cannot be the only sort of approach that we, um, that we use, particularly in, in places like Niger that are economically incredibly vulnerable. 
for us practicing here has been really an exercise in trying to figure out how to make a contemporary architecture in a way that doesn't break the bank, right? And that doesn't have, you know, that doesn't make, that doesn't create this, um, this impossible choice of either you make yourself, you quote unquote modernize yourself supposedly by making yourself look as Western as possible, which is incredibly expensive and unaffordable and unmaintainable long-term, or you're kind of like stuck, you know, doing something from 200 years ago, neither one of which is desirable, neither one of which really works. So it's really been about tapping into those memories to try to find a way forward, um, but also trying to bring new ideas you know, for, for the future and for the challenges that we are bound to face, even as a planet. And I think I'm, I'm gonna try to, to, to end on this project. Um, more recently, uh, we've been putting this approach to the test for projects outside of the continent. Um, the one, this one is um, a proposal for the National Black Theater in Harlem. Um, and for which we imagine really an interior space within its new home, which is kind of this multi-story, you might have seen the announced for, for it, um, this um, multi-story mixed use um, building, and that we imagined a, um, an interior kind of treatment, you know, or kind of um, architecture for its new home. And here too, you know, obviously the power of memory was something that was just kind of the first step, right? We all have, you know, a history and that history um, made who we are, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, and because this project was about also a black narrative in, in America, um, we looked at both West Africa, you know, kind of the origins, but also because of how its spiritual power was kind of um, kept alive, you know, within the slaves that were brought here um, to the American shores, but also images like these that represent, you know, some of the cabins you know, that, this, that um, the slaves built, for example. And the, that was because you know, I couldn't help but see some of the motifs from, their home, from our homes in these cabins, you know, memories in a way of the lives um, they were taken from. It seemed, you know, obviously there were a lot of, you know, some of the slaves that were brought had enormous amounts of skill you know, that has been widely documented and were experts you know and, and builders you know and you name it and helped build some of the most significant monuments you know in America even and so really kind of tapping into you know this this terrible history but then kind of you know finding trying to find ways to surmount that and to celebrate the triumph um, that it is to actually be black in America today um, the project really delved into this you know and it became also about, you know, just like we would do in Niger or in Ghana, you know, or, or elsewhere, you know, about trying to find, you know, the local materials, in which case we kind of zeroed in, you know, on wood, which again, you know, goes back to that image of the cabin, you know, rather than earth. And then, you know, kind of, kind of um, take our cue from some of the spatial and structural logics, you know, common to both places, you know, West Africa and, um, and America. Um, and then, Ultimately, it started, you know, being embedded with, you know, notions of, you know, the smell of the raw, raw wood, you know, for example, of these cabins, you know, their form, um, and the sometimes kind of exquisite care with which, you know, um, the skills and the aesthetic memories of a homeland can, or of a home, you know, kind of um, continent can accompany one into a new reality, no matter how kind of horrifying that reality, right? And so ultimately, I think for me, um, projects like these, you know, and the practice that I've been um, privileged to be able to continue, hasn't been so much about creating an architecture for the African context per se, but it's been ultimately um, about making an architecture that is true for a place and that anchors us in our identities, that instills pride and dignity in its users. And I think that is one of the many valuable things you know, that we have to offer as architects. And so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that um, really, really inspiring lecture. And uh, before I ask you about 
um, some of the specifics uh, regarding the projects that you presented. Uh, I, I want to ask you, and I think the, the students might also find this interesting. Um, can you maybe tell us, when you were a student um, in, in, at Washington, uh, did you imagine then that you would return to Niger to practice architecture or what motivated you to return home to practice? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Actually, <laughs> actually, yes, um, that was my objective from the beginning. Um, because one of, one of the things I guess that was a little bit different for me, you know, studying architecture was that it was my second career. So I, I was a software developer before becoming an architect, but I kind of wanted to be an architect since I was a teenager, but I didn't know anybody in my grandma who was an architect. It seemed something that fit me um, because I was very kind of science minded, but also, you know, I was very artistic and I drew and I painted, you know, and all of those things. And it just seemed to make sense. But kind of when push came to shove, I just could not pull that trigger. It just seemed, you know, coming from where I come from, and having the incredible luck to be able to be sent thousands of miles away to get this kind of world-class education, I just did not feel like I had the right to study something creative. It just seemed like it needed to be something, you know, um, more pragmatic, like being an engineer or a doctor, you know, or a lawyer, you know, which is the story of almost every African immigrant you will meet you know, in America, right? All of us um, are in this situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whether it's coming from us or from family pressures, you know, or whatever. But in, in my case, it was fully me, you know. I just I just decided that this just was not reasonable. But you know, fast forward almost 10 years, you know, this kind of desire to be an architect never never left me. Um, and I just always yearned for that. But I think the thing that gave me the push, which explains why I knew I wanted to work in Niger when I went to architecture school was because I started seeing um, all the ways in which architecture, you know, actually fundamentally, obviously shapes, shapes our environment fully, right? But then all the ways in which it was used in the most horrific ways where I come from, you know, all the, all the contradictions, all the um, uh, kind of, it, there were just so many illogical things, you know, that I saw. Um, it just started becoming this whole, the social dimension, the political dimension, you know, the economic dimension of architecture started becoming something that was so important, you know, and so kind of alarming to me that that gave me the ultimate push. And I just kind of stopped everything, went back to school. But then I went back to school knowing what I wanted to, to turn this degree into, which was also, you know, obviously gives you an incredible kind of laser beam focus, right? Like through, through the education. Um, and meant also that I saw, you know, certain professors, I saw certain, you know, kind of like trying to learn certain specific things just to kind of make sure that I would be ready for something like this. And um, in the, the introduction, I, I noted that you had participated in the, um, the Rolex uh, mentorship program with, uh, with David, David Ajay. Um, would you... And I, I promise I will sort of move away from this topic and talk about the, the work. But I'm just also wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about your experience uh, working in Niamey and um, you know, uh, having studied in Washington, the University of Washington, what it's like now to kind of be there on the ground, uh, if you don't mind, and also as a, as a woman uh, practicing architecture, you know, what have been the, the rewards and perhaps some of the challenges that you faced? Yeah, um, so, so I think the, the mentorship itself um, from the beginning, since it's not that kind, the kind of thing that you can apply for, they just kind of find you. So it was just, you know, this, this, this um, situation that all of a sudden, um, it was incredibly stressful in the sense that I had to figure out, you know, how to make the most of it, right? <laughs> just like very, like, if you have access to David Edge for two years, like you have to make something out of that. Um, and what was incredible about the mentorship was that, you know, from the beginning, and I've talked about this many times, but because I just found it so, so incredible, you know, his, his approach was, well, I'm not interested in just, you know, 
you know, just kind of giving you, you know, or, 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 or bringing you to my office and just kind of like, you know, force feeding you all of these things that I do, you know, I think it will be much more interesting for you to tell me what you want to do. And then I'll help you, you know, along that route, which was incredibly powerful, right? Which also meant that the mentorship ended up being all about the context in which I'm working and the challenges um, that come with that, you know, both in terms of, um, kind of developing this new way forward that I was talking about from an architecture point of view, how to think through the context, you know, both in, in kind of practical ways, um, but also in, in fundamental philosophical ways, you know, in, in terms of colonization, in terms of, you know, reclaiming one's identity, in terms of kind of, you know, being true to one's culture um, in general, you know, on a more fundamental level as i said it's not this is not an african problem it's actually a problem that 80 percent of the world has and 80 percent of the world that's not the western world right uh, we in a way all have this challenge um, to tackle through and the mentorship was kind of this very very powerful conversation you know it felt that lasted two years you know that was all about exploring those things you know and david coming to Nisha and seeing the context and kind of you know, me being able to also see the context through his eyes was also incredibly powerful and incredibly clarifying also um, in terms of thinking and in terms of, um, you know, figuring out how to parse things, you know, properly. But then, you know, that, that put aside, I think, you know, when it comes to the notion of gender that you were, that you were um, talking about, you know, I think one of, maybe like, unfortunately in Niger, there are very few architects, period. So the side effect of that is that you actually do not encounter as much gender related issues because there's so few of us to begin with that um, at the end of the day is not as big of a problem um, as it is actually in other countries or, or as I might even encounter in the US frankly. Um, because also, you know, gender issues are fundamentally different here than they are in the US. They're not so much about you know, people questioning your intelligence or your ability, they're more about people questioning maybe your role, you know, in, in the community, right? So when you come back, um, and this is something that that is both unfortunate, but in the end, you know, ended up working for me. Um, I think when you come back also with a degree from the US, um, it helps to break those barriers because there's kind of this idea that, oh, okay, so, not only is your gender not being looked at as, as something that means that you're not as intelligent, that's not an issue. But if you come back with this, this really good education, then automatically this kind of this authority, you know, um, kind of label, you know, um, that you get to enjoy. Um, and that really helps mitigate, not to say that there are no issues, you know, you can be on construction sites, or you can even meet clients and um, they will be talking to your architects rather than talking to you or, you know, but that kind of works out, you know, um, eventually rather quickly. So it's not easy, but um, it has many silver line linings and it has many kind of, you know, um, ways to surmount, I guess, the, any kind of gender barriers that might be there. Yeah, I'd say, uh, one of the things I really appreciate uh, about uh, or from your talk is the way that you spoke about memory, memory as a blueprint, um, and uh, in which you spoke about, let's say the uh, that the memory is 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 in the uh, is in the masons. You talked about memory in terms of community. I'd say also you know, in terms of uh, materiality, in terms of the. Uh, the earthen materials that you use in the building. And it struck me as you were talking about memory. And, and first, I think you talked about uh, memory, you know, particularly in, in Europe or the US as being relegated to museums, that, um, that your work is also, I guess, challenging that typology of museum, um, that typology that, let's say, is a collection of, of, of artifacts as a way of knowing knowledge or or organizing knowledge and ultimately challenging, I guess, the kind of Euro-American epistemology um, to think about memory and, and some other memory as another way of being. So I'm wondering if you might just kind of talk to us a little bit more about, um, about this other way of knowing or this other kind of memory or these other kind of memories. I think, I think we've unfortunately kind of fallen into this, you know, um, 
I mean, there are many reasons why you know museums are what they are and became what they are. One of the reasons being actually that you know, um, kind of taking over other countries and you know taking all of their resources actually created the need for for museums because then where do you put all of these things that you stole, um, and that they continue they continue being there. So in a way, that typology you know that is a typology that was born of you know all this looting and, and all of this um, terrible, you know, all these terrible ills, you know, that were done. Um, uh, and, that, and that continued to happen, right? And so in of itself, then the purpose of the museum is about in a way showcasing all these, all these riches that you've amassed at other people's, you know, ex, you know like um, from, other, from, from other territories. And so, the, the problem that I end up having is when I think about the idea of memory and the idea of museums in a context such as ours, where, so we don't have that history. We don't have that baggage of having gone and taken someone else's thing that we then need to show a local population. And so what does a museum, what, is, what would be a museum for from that point of view, which is a question that, you know, I, I struggle with and that I'm, you know, um, I've been exploring through a couple of competitions but at the end of the day, I think there's something fundamentally wrong, perhaps, if I may say, about taking a collection of things, freezing them into time, placing them in these glass boxes. And in a way, it allows us to continue kind of this, these modernist ideas of a before and after. It, it, it prevents continuities. It prevents, you know, it, it impoverishes quite frankly, the tools that we have at our, our, our disposal, you know, in terms of what we can imagine and how we can see the future and how we can see ourselves. In, in our case, because these things have been removed from our territories altogether. So kind of imagining yourself and projecting yourself in the future becomes a, a problem actually, because how do you do that when you don't know your own history or that when your history has been robbed from you, right? Same thing, you know, you were mentioning at the beginning of the lecture, when it, came, when it comes to indigenous, you know, spaces and architecture and knowledge that has been completely ignored, you know, um, and America being the ultimate, ultimate colonial project, right? Where it just kind of made this, this empire <laughs> in its own image in a place that is stolen from other people that had a history, that had an architecture, that had, you know, incredible cultures, you know, museums are obviously complicit in that, but museums are something that I think even for architecture presents a really grave problem, you know, in how we move forward in, in history. And I think that is a question that we are going to have to grapple with for some time if we're serious about kind of both decolonizing our knowledge systems, if we're serious about, you know, starting to actually really see, you know, the rest of the world as equal beings, you know, um, to us and, and really take advantage of all of these different knowledges that are available and that enrich us you know, as a species, you know, this is something that we're going to have to grapple on that obviously I don't have an answer for, for but that, you know, we just need to, <laughs> we, need, we, we need to, yeah, that, that we need to look at seriously beyond just the notion of retribution, which we're talking about now in terms of returning, you know, artifacts. It goes way beyond that because once again, it, it froze time and it froze time for several centuries. What does that mean? And for me, that's what, you know, that's what we work on in the sense that it's always about unearthing, you know, all of the forgotten things, you know, everything, everything, all of the forgotten, but also erased, you know, narratives. At the end of the day, that's why we don't have a choice but to then speak of and tap into living memories, you know, through the skills of people, through the daily habits and behaviors through because that's what gives us the cues, you know, to the essence of those memories, because they're the result of those memories, even though they're not conscious. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it seems to me that that actually it throws the, the larger question about uh, it, it throws the idea of typology, if you will, into, into question because um, I think that uh, you know, one of the, the other things that I appreciated about, the, uh, about your talk um, was also just kind of 
you know, exposing, if you will, um, for those of us who might not have been as familiar, um, you know, you showed the, the photograph of the, the great mosque at, at Jinne, which I've actually been to, um, um, but you showed that photograph and then showed how it was extracted and then reappropriated in terms of colonial architecture, right, in terms yes. of colonial typologies, um, or, the, uh, or the mosque at, uh, at Timbuktu. And so when we come to, you know, a project of yours like the, like the flea market or um, the mosque at uh, Danjaji, I mean, I think what you're doing there is, you know, it's not so much about the typology, if you will, but it's about the hybrid condition. So the, you know, the, the, the flea market that you've reorganized around this, this tree, the, the mosque that is also a, a community center, you know, at, at the end of the day, it seems to me that perhaps the, you know, what it is as a typology goes away and it's much more about how it gets used in the everyday. No, absolutely, you know, it's, and, and that's the thing, and that's why I try to, as much as possible, remove myself from obsessing over form, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, if it is just about the form, then there's no more meaning, right? You can just take, it's just an image, then we're just doing, what we're doing is just sculpture, you know? Like that's, at the end of the day, that's, that's about it. Even though architecture is sculpture, but it's also a spatial art. So often I think, you know, by, by obsessing so much over the forms, we, we forget the space. And I think what has been really key for me has been really doubling down on this notion of, <clears throat> sorry, of space and how, and, and how those memories can help inform how those spaces need to function, whether it's in terms of how they mitigate the climate or how they bring people together, you know, like it for, for the market or how they can actually help combat in the, in the case of um, the community center, extremist notions. But without having to get on your soapbox and say that extremist notions are bad, but by creating the kind of you know, spatial relationships and situation where someone who might think that actually you know, some secular knowledge that you will learn at school is kind of um, incompatible with religious knowledge, using an old mosque to turn into a library was quite difficult. It was a very difficult thing to do, right? But in, in the end of the day, it, it did work um, for many, many reasons that we don't have to get into it. It ended up working. But one of the things that we were trying to achieve by doing that was to also create this center where by the very simple fact that people would be in the library and because we pray five times a day, you know, have to walk over, you know, this landscape and go into the mosque and then walk back, that back and forth actually helps dissolve this notion of, you know, um, kind of um, incompatibility between these two things, because that incompatibility is a completely made up notion by, you know, some extremists, you know, along our borders, you know, or something like that. So for me, it's been, yeah, no, not so much about typology, but it's also been about looking at, you know, local challenges and looking at some of the really important issues people are grappling with and trying to figure out what is the place of design and what is the place of architecture, you know, um, among all of this. Not to say that, you know, we get to, you know, fix everything and tackle everything, but we certainly can make, you know, some, some serious, um, uh, can, can, can bring some serious, serious value because if we can destroy things, which we do all day long, right? We destroy communities through architecture, we destroy communities through urban design, um, we incarcerate people through architecture, we do all kinds of things through architecture. So then it means that the reverse is also true. We can also elevate through architecture. We can also dignify through architecture and we can also build people up through architecture. I, I, and I, I know we have a, you know, a question in the, in the Q&A, but I, I don't want to let that one go because uh, what you just said go, because I was also taken by um, you know, when you talked about, you know, looking at whether or not there are the step wall, uh, step wells in India or the wind catchers in Iran, uh, or looking at South America for uh, uh, issues that might be similar, that there's a kind of horizontal um, relationships that you are, that you're forming or that you're looking at relative to your work, rather than what one might expect in terms of looking north to Europe or looking to 
uh, to America that you're actually, I should say to the United States, uh, that you're actually sort of looking horizontally, if you will, and that there's a kind of, um, maybe, not, maybe not collaborative, but there's a kind of acknowledgement, if you will, of, uh, uh, of a perhaps similar conditions of, of extraction of colonialism that have happened in these places and how uh, other indigenous populations have, you know, have constructed, have made place in light of that. And um, I don't know if you could maybe just kind of talk a little bit more yeah. about the importance of looking horizontally. No, absolutely. For me, that has been so fundamental. That has been really key. Because once again, all of us, as you pointed out, are always looking up, you know, as though somehow there was just like an anointed few that hold the key to every, you know, to the solution of every problem, you know, on the planet, which is incredibly absurd. So for me, you know, again, even when I was studying architecture, it was about finding, you know, these relationships, you know, these similar conditions. You know, I spent a huge amount of time looking towards India, for example, you know, both because of the common colonial um, condition, but also as a place that has actually already a couple of generations ago went through this exercise with, with you know, architects like about Krishna Doshi or with Charles Korea, um, but, and also frankly with, you know, architects like Louis Kahn who tried to do an architecture that is more of a translation of the local conditions rather than a superimposition of you know a western style of architecture and so i was just always interested in all of the architects who did that right you know in south america it would be louis barragan louis barragan for example you know and it was just it, those were always kind of the the conduit you know because at the end of the day i was not and i am not interested you know in duplicating a western model because it doesn't make sense in most places in the world. It developed the way it developed there because it made sense there. When we make a house that is a box where everything is self-contained, we have to do that in the West because it gets cold and you have to conserve heat. When you do that in Niger and it's 110 degrees outside, you are making an oven. It's as simple as that. So for me, beyond even the identity and the cultural issues, there's just like simple logical problems with looking north, you know, that I just, it's just completely illogical at the end of the day, you know? So that's why I'm looking horizontally also and across geographies and across climates, because those are the things, you know, for as long as we've been making architecture, those are the things that actually affect architecture and affect the decisions that we make in the forms that we produce historically. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn to the Q and A now, and um, our first question is from uh, Farouk Pane. Um, and Farouk says, "Hi, Miriam. Uh, Farouk here." Uh, Masters of Architecture, third year from Accra, Ghana. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. In reading books like Udo Kulturman's New Direction in Africa, he mentions that contemporary architecture in Africa uh, is way too diverse, uh, heterogeneous, and sometimes contradictory to be readily defined as African architecture. What are your opinions on this and that African, uh, and that African architecture should look, feel, or be some type of way or have a certain aesthetic because I feel you are responding perfectly to your context in Niamey and in Niger. Couldn't agree more. Um, I don't think, you know, we can talk about an African condition in terms of history, in terms of colonization, in terms of some of the social economic challenges, actually, I shouldn't even say social, I should just say economic challenges. But the reality is we are incredibly diverse as a, because we're a continent, no matter how, no, no matter, um, in spite of the fact that we're always talked about as though we were just one place, right? So there, I'm not sure there is such a thing or that there should be such a thing as an African architecture. However, there can be a thing as an architecture born of Africa and a certain set of common challenges, right? Now, when it comes to when you're thinking about, 
you know, I, I should say region to region, not country to country, because again, you know, then you fall onto, under this other problem of the fact that our countries are artificial. And that 60 years ago, our countries did not exist, right? So they're not actually even a real thing. So the architecture that we do in Niger would be, you know, completely relevant to Northern Nigeria, for example, as well, but now the rest of Nigeria, it would be completely appropriate in, you know, Western Mali, and it would be completely appropriate for parts of Burkina Faso, because that, you know, has the, the same kind of climatic and geographic conditions and also historically speaking, you know, we're drawing from the precedence of those regions, right? Now, if we have to do a project in Ghana, that's a completely different ballgame because number one, the, the material is completely different. You know, it can be earth, but there's also a lot of wood. You know, the culture is shockingly different, you know, and that's, we're still in West Africa. So if you actually take it to East Africa or to Central Africa, to Southern Africa, then, you know, all hell breaks loose. So, I don't think we should be reductive and reduce ourselves down to a continental expression, but we do have to acknowledge that we share a set of common challenges. And with that comes maybe a certain subset of common responses that could work, but in the overarching main, you know, kind of moves, they cannot necessarily be the same. I hope I've answered your question, Farouk. <laughs> Okay, for, uh, and we have one question uh, here in the in the auditorium. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Maria. My name is Anushe, and I'm an MARC third year as well. Um, so I was just really I've followed your work for quite a while, and I I'm really impressed by everything you do. So thank you, and thank you for your presentation and your comments. Um, my question surrounds the idea of participatory design. I'm very cognizant that you have a very Western education, right? And you're working in a very different context. So how do you incorporate, I guess, participation by design or for design from the community? Like how do you, how, what, what are some of the mechanisms that you maybe employ to gather as much information as possible from who you work with? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really varies from project to project, right? But I think we also need to be incredibly careful when we talk about participatory um, design, because I think at some point it became kind of this fashionable thing, especially through, you know, um, certain studios, you know, that, you know, kind of go in kind of so-called underdeveloped parts of the world, you know, and try to do um, these exercises, and it's, it became kind of this, this, um, this message about the fact that in order to empower people, then we need to have them build their own architecture. Um, however, <laughs> I think um, that's slightly strange proposition in the sense that people have jobs and people have economic activities and they have, you know, other things, you know, that they need to get done in their life. So the, the idea that everybody should be building their own home and, you know, um, and should be, you know, kind of participating in building, you know, the environment. It's a little bit strange considering that that's not an idea that we would propose anywhere else in the world. Um, that being said, I think what you're talking about in terms of participatory um, design specifically is more in terms of maybe community consultation and involvement in the design phases. And for that, um, like I said, depending on the project we're working on, we will approach it differently and the, the people we would approach also would be different. So if we're working on a project like the um, community center in Dandash, for example, then the whole village was our terrain, right? You know, and we would create different sessions with different people, you know, um, different, different kind of subsections of the village. So we might have a, a seance with, uh, with teenagers only, for example, another one with only women, another one with everybody, another one with the male leaders, you know, another one, you know, because again, it's about, at the end of the day, understanding the context in which you work and to understand the, the forces at work in that context, so that you can also avoid conflicts among the forces and that you can really harness as much information as you possibly can by designing <laughs> um, sort of these strategies to get information and to get, you know, kind of information and desires and hopes and dreams, you know, out of people, which is a very inexact science, right? So I cannot tell you that, you know, you do X, Y, Z, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, those are the steps 
you know, go ahead. It completely depends on, um, on the context and it depends on what you have access to and who you have access to. But it, for me, it definitely has not been um, in the forms of, you know, sometimes what we see is maybe almost like a town hall, you know, um, type of situation where you bring everybody in and you do a charade or you, you know, explain the project and get input. It definitely has not been like that for me. For me, it's been kind of a lot more, um, like I said, smaller groups, different and varied groups, but also um, different forms of exercises to kind of run people through that allow you to, in a way, get to the bottom of what people are truly thinking and truly feeling, rather than, you know, if you ask them directly, a lot of times what I've discovered is like people would tend to tell you what you, what they think you want to hear. Um, that's, that's been a fundamental, fundamental thing that I noticed actually when I was a student and I first started researching. And then so I had to just kind of like change tack um, from that point of view. And then you, in a way you have to become um, a psychologist almost, uh, where you have to start figuring out these ways of finding out the truth within, you know, and there is, that is, there's no like uh, magic bullet for it, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, Miriam, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for, for, this, uh, for this inspiring talk, and um, I look forward to, uh, to your gathering with the Masters of Architecture uh, second year students tomorrow um, in, their, in their housing studio, and hopefully we will get to see you here uh, at GSAP sometime in the, in the near future. Um, for everyone who uh, uh, participated and, and watched our, our lecture today, um, I'd just like to call your attention to a number of events going on uh, later this week. Uh, geographer academ and academic Rob Kitchen examines the conceptual underpinnings and practices of urban science. Uh, that's coming up, I believe, on Wednesday. Alvaro Siza discusses his latest book in conversation with Professor Kenneth Frampton on Thursday and on Friday. The GSAP Collective for Beirut organizes a conversation uh, around the recent publication of Reconnecting Beirut. So thank you again, everyone, for, uh, for attending uh, today's lecture, and uh, we'll see you again at the next Dean's Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary.